Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Michael Crow here, president of Arizona State University. It's really uh, great uh, to have everybody showing up for what I think will be a fantastic uh, talk by a fantastic author here with our tomorrow talks. Uh, we've got Melinda Gates here with us, who is the co-chair of the Gates Foundation, but I think uh, that doesn't even begin to uh, uh, capture the totality of the, of the quest that she's on. This new book that you'll hear uh, about, the, the Moment of Life, that you'll hear a lot about is a book that um, you know, really is, is unbelievably focused on this notion that we still have not found the pathway to understanding that we're all equal, that if we don't uh, bring uh, men and women in our society and others to a position of uh, equal opportunity to uh, embrace the full uh, totality of their 85 billion neurons and the full creativity of everything that a human being is uh, designed to do and to be, and if we don't Think about things about gender and race in different ways. And if we don't once and for all defeat this notion of inequality, then uh, we will never realize the full potential of our, of our species. We'll never, any one of us will ever uh, really fully realize the full potential of ourselves because we'll be living in an incomplete world. So Melinda, the book has been very powerful to me. Uh, uh, further evidence of your deep commitment to, uh, on all the things that you're doing personally, the things you're doing as co-chair, the things that you're doing through the foundation and other things are just, I mean, they have to be done and they have to be pushed and they have to be driven out and they have to be brought also into a format where we can embrace it. And so the other thing I liked about the book very much was uh, its uh, accessibility, its, its uh, personal feeling, its ability to draw out emotion from things that uh, uh, we need to understand uh, more deeply. So thank you, uh, Melinda, for, uh, for being here. Thank, uh, thank you also for the, you know, all that you've done to help push ASU up the hill. So we're really appreciative of what the Gates Foundation has done. And so uh, we've got a lot of sponsors here tonight. We have the publishers, Macmillan. Uh, we've got uh, the Division of Humanities in uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at, at ASU, which I like to say sometimes is larger than the University of Oregon, just that college, just to put that into perspective. We, we smile about that. Uh, our Department of English which is also a huge, uh, fantastic program involving thousands of learners, tens of thousands of learners. Uh, our Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, which is really helping us to intellectually understand how we can really fulfill the dream of democracy, which is unfulfilled in our country. Uh, uh, until we can solve these problems, we will never be the rich, conceptualized democracy that, uh, that has been uh, uh, laid before us and our school for civic and economic thought and leadership, which is uh, taking a look at the philosophical underpinnings of that democracy. So Melinda, great to have you here. Appreciate it very much. And I'm gonna turn things over to Dean Jeffrey Cohen, who's the Dean of Humanities. But let me say that, and Melinda, you might be interested by this. You know, we have, we have over 4,000 humanities majors. We have tens of thousands of students engaged with us. We have students engaged in learning the humanities across the entire world from the entire world. Uh, and Jeffrey has just done a fantastic job as, as Dean bringing us to this point. And so Jeffrey, I, I turn things over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, President Kerr. Really appreciate that. And you know, it's a good day when the president of your university has more books on his desk than you do as Dean of Humanities. I'm, I'm <laughs> always impressed by what President Kerr is reading. I'll be very brief. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce our two guests. Melinda Gates is a philanthropist, businesswoman, and global advocate for women and girls. As the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Melinda sets the direction and priorities of the world's largest philanthropy. She's also the founder of Pivotal Ventures, an investment and incubation company working to drive social progress for women and families in the United States. She's the author of the best-selling book, The Moment of Lift, that she will join us. She's joining us to speak about tonight. She will be in conversation with Aviva Dove Viban, who is Assistant Professor of Film and Media Studies, a part of our English department here at ASU, contributing editor for the Scholar Writing Program at Ms. Magazine. She's currently co-editing a collection of essays entitled Public Feminisms from Academy to Community and working on a book project interrogating gendered representations of power and knowledge on television. And I'll say Aviva and I started in the English department on the same day. And it's really been a pleasure to see the effect that she's had on ASU and to see her here, here tonight in conversation. So welcome everyone. We're very happy that you joined us tonight. And over to you, Aviva and 
Well, thank you so much, Dean Cohen, for that lovely introduction. Um, and Melinda, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you tonight. And I think, uh, I know everyone is really excited about, about hearing more from you um, and more about your book. So I wanted to start off um, by getting at what I, I feel like is the heart of the issues that you discuss in the moment of lift, uh, in which you argue that empowering women and girls um, and lifting women and girls up has significant ripple effects that as you say, can change the world. So early on in the book, you write, and this is a quote, overcoming the need to create outsiders is our greatest challenge as human beings. It is the key to ending deep equality. So why is that your overarching ideology and why do we need to start there? Mm. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to do this talk about my book. And um, well, let me just talk for a minute about why I wrote the book. And I think that might set us up for this next to the, your question, which is, um, you know, I've been lucky enough for the foundation uh, for over 20 years now to be able to travel, not so much this year during the pandemic at all. Um, but during before that, you know, I've met so many people in so many places around the world, whether it's Bangladesh or I'm out in a rural village in Tanzania or I'm somewhere in Senegal. And, you know, I would sit and talk with people about their lives and they'd open their homes to me or their community. And these women just really had these stories about their lives that moved me and they animated my life and my work. And I felt like if they were willing to share their lives with me, then I ought to be willing to take their issues to the global stage because they would so often be telling me about things that they were hoping would change in their community. And I think, you know, that really comes at the heart of what the foundation does and which, you know, the values that we live by, which is we are trying to solve these global inequities. And we need only by solving inequities and really acknowledging the gaps in society and how we view one another, are we going to be able to get at these things to really build the world that we want, whether it's the democracy in the United States or whether it's in another country. And yet I think so often we don't want to face those inequities because the issues are hard or somebody doesn't look like us or doesn't live in our neighborhood. And yet we have to embrace one another because none of us are exactly the same. And yet we're more alike than we are different. And I think sometimes we forget that as human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you talk about um, at one point in the book, a kind of doctrine of, of love, right? And empathy. And I think that really speaks to what you're, you were just talking about right now. Um, you say, I think love is more urgent than doctrine um, and how empathy and connection are central to making the world a better place. So how does, how does something like love, like empathy, sort of just piggybacking off of what you were just talking about, lead to creating these moments of lift that you discuss in the book? Well, I believe in connection, connection between human beings. And when you know when you have a deep connection with somebody, you feel it. It resonates in their eyes. It resonates in your eyes. And those are sort of these moments, these sort of sparks that go off. And, you know, if we didn't know it before how connected we are, the pandemic has certainly shown us that because this virus has traveled around the world. And yet when you ask people what they most deeply miss during the pandemic, they will tell you it's, you know, usually connection with a loved one or somebody they care about. And so I think when we have connection with others, we can have more empathy for one another's positions or situation. Mm -hmm. And that really is really the basis then for love. And for me, I will say, and I hope for others, action then, action on behalf of others. I was lucky enough um, to go to a school. My parents, uh, I come from a Catholic family. I write about that a little bit in the book. Mm -hmm. My parents uh, sent my siblings and me K through 12 to Catholic school High school, I was lucky enough. I went to an all-girls school, but run by very liberal nuns. And they really taught us that each of us can make a difference in someone else's life. And sometimes it's in ways that feel very small, but they really aren't. When you put a drop in the pond, it's like a ripple goes out, right? And so sometimes that's connecting with somebody and lifting someone up. Sometimes that's helping with a need that they have. Sometimes it's lifting up more than one person, maybe a hundred people. Um, but that really is at the heart of what I believe about connection and empathy and love. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that 
that is, it really comes across in the book how you are drawing all of these connections between um, both thinking about connections between people and how those can change the world, right? Or how those can change people's individuals, living situations, um, or sort of can move up through the region, through communities, more, and even nationally or globally. Um, but you also relate um, many of the things that you talk about in the book through connections between um, between things that are affecting women and girls and families, right? So I found it really striking how you emphasize that everything um, is connected. You talk about, for example, um, one of your earliest chapters is about the importance of the availability of contraceptives, mm -hmm. right, in the developing world and and elsewhere. Um, and then you you show, I think, throughout the book how women in the developing world, which is part of the focus, how their access to birth control impacts maternal health, impacts the rates of infant mortality, impacts poverty, child marriage, incidents of domestic violence, and how these things are all connected. So if you could just spend a little, a little bit of time talking about, and I think that my question is twofold. So one, when you started to realize how connected these issues were, mm -hmm. but also um, how you sort of work to to think about them all and to sort of work through them all because it's a lot of things all at once. Yeah. Um, well, again, when I would be out traveling so often, I would be in these communities and I was there to talk about vaccinations for children, which is something the foundation works on, or, you know, maybe supplies in the local health clinic, you know, and but I would also ask the question of women, like what the other issues were, or if I left enough time, once we talked about vaccinations, women kept bringing this conversation around so often to contraceptives. And I kept thinking, that's odd, whether, you know, in all these different places I was in the world. And I started to realize that the more I listened to women, the more they were saying to me, do you not see? This woman, one woman said to me, do you not see? This is a crisis for me. I have five children. Look at my tiny plot of land. My husband's gone in the city to try and find a job. I can't eke out a crop barely on this land and feed these five children. It wouldn't be fair to them for me to have a sixth child. But she said, look at that little health clinic over there. I used to be able to go there and get contraceptives and I can't. And it's a crisis for me. And she opened my eyes to what women were telling me around the world over and over again, that think about it. If a woman doesn't have access to a contraceptive, if she can't space the births of her children and decide how many she will have, we are locking her into a cycle of poverty. And so if you flip it back to us in the United States and you think about women in the United States, what allowed more women to go to university go, and then get a job in the workforce? The birth control pill. Mm -hmm. And we don't often think about these contraceptives that we sort of take for granted in the United States that men and women use. We use them so that we can decide when and whether to have children. And I will say for myself, and I've had, it's had to be personal for me. I had to say, you know, okay, you know, I needed contraceptives to stay in university to then go on and have the career and then have the three children I would like to have when I had them. But what I've come to learn is that contraceptives is one of the very first things, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the first things that unlocks empowerment for women and girls because then they can get educated and get the job they want mm -hmm. and have the productive life that they want. Um, but conversely, if you don't allow that tool or you don't allow a woman to have it or to take that decision for herself, you are literally leaving her in poverty because she then will have child after child after child um, with no means to, to decide if and when. And so we have to make these connections that so often we don't want to make. And what I'm learning is that so often because women haven't had the power or the resources we often as a globe, if it's a prime minister or a president, or you, I used to show up at these meetings at the UN 10 years ago, people didn't want to talk about the gender issues. It was almost like that was a side issue. No, that's actually the central issue because who feeds children around the world? Women. Who makes sure they're educated? 
women, right? When she gets a little bit more income, she actually spends it differently than her husband spends it. And so women are the center of the family and we need to empower them if we're really going to change things. Yeah, that really struck me how you you discuss in the book how even within the foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, in your early work, people were reluctant to talk about gender, right? In Very. In, yeah. <laughs> We're a very heady place. You know, we're, we're all about science. We're getting the next vaccine. We're getting the next HIV drug. Well, guess what? (laughs) Who takes the children to get the vaccinations? Quite often it's the mom, you know, who's most affected by HIV on the continent of Africa, young adolescent girls in South Africa, many other places in Africa. But if we can't get the tool that she can use into her hands, we're not going to change the face of AIDS. So yeah, even inside our own shop, we had to get people used to talking about gender. And now they're realizing how central it is to their strategy if they're going to carry out the work all the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I realized I was so eager to sort of jump right into your um, your book that I put the cart before the horse a little bit because I would really like to hear, and I'm sure Um, All the people listening, especially students, would be especially interested to hear a little bit about your career trajectory. Um, I'm sure many of us um, know a fair bit already, but I would love to hear some more about um, your career trajectory at Microsoft and then at the foundation. Um, But I especially am interested in hearing more about your philosophy uh, regarding the importance of making mistakes and learning from failure, which you talk quite a bit about. Um, So could could you speak a little more on that? Sure. So um, after high school, I went to Duke University, got an undergraduate degree in computer science. And I think it's important to just pause here and say that for my parents, I had three other siblings. So putting four of us through college wasn't easy. Um, And so I really valued my education. So I went three years undergraduate, two years of business school, and I got scooped up by Microsoft at age 23. Um, It was the first time they recruited at Duke. Um, I got scooped up into their first MBA class at Microsoft. And when I joined the company, there were less than 1,700 employees. So it's still a very small company. Um, And I worked there for nine years. And it was, um, I learned a lot. We were changing the world is what we believed. And we, we, we were, we knew it. I mean, it was before there was Windows. There was before there were word processors and an Excel spreadsheet as we know it today. Um, so I had a nine-year career there. And uh, then I left at the birth, met, I had met Bill early in the company after we got married. I left at the birth of our first daughter because I really felt like I wanted to make sure that we could raise a family. And Bill was CEO of Microsoft and very hard charging and traveling a lot. Um, but I also knew I still wanted to be a professional woman. And so very quickly thereafter, we had ju- already begun the foundation, but I started to become very, very involved in it. And I started traveling around the United States to learn about some of the issues of inequity. Um, and now I've worked at the foundation for well over 20 years. I didn't want to be full-time at the foundation until our last daughter started preschool, and I was lucky enough to not have to do that. Uh, now it's more than full-time. Um <laughs> And I've, you know, been there as the foundation has grown and expanded and um, it is, it is my life's work and I absolutely love it. And, and what about, um, what about the sort of process of making mistakes and learning? Oh, from right. So, mistakes? well, first of all, I'm a, um, I call myself a horrible perfectionist. <laughs> if you had met me six years ago, um, you know, I don't know, somehow I got this silly notion somewhere along the way that I had to be perfect at things. And the opposite is true. Once you start to look, I'll say, once I started to look at my own perfectionism and say, oh my gosh, I'm spending way too much time preparing for things, way too much time, you know, reading a script for something instead of just going there and being myself, right? Mm-hmm. And as soon as I started to become more myself and speak off the cuff or say in a meeting at the foundation, could you stop again and explain that? I didn't quite understand that. You know, I don't have a biology background and I'm sitting there at a table of scientists, right? Who are talking about biology. But what I find is often when I ask a question, then other people are willing to say what they don't know and ask a question. Then we're all there 
creatively working together. Um, so I've had to really look at my perfectionism and uh, I have learned to laugh at a lot of the mistakes I've made, even during this COVID time, not even, I should say even more during this COVID time have I made mistakes. Like I've been on Zoom calls or Microsoft Teams where you know, I've taken over the slides inadvertently and there are three dozen people on the video and no one wants to say, Melinda, you've taken over the slides, click them back, you know? And I have to say, oh wait, that was me and I don't know how. <laughs> So the more you can sort of laugh at yourself and ask for support, but you sort of allow others around you to be imperfect. We're all imperfect. And um, I learn my best in safe environments and I try to create now safe environments for other people to learn by showing what some of my weaknesses are. Well, and, and you talk in the book how that has become part of your leadership style, right? And I think that that's really essential for um for sort of making it, as you say, making it possible for people to feel like they can not only make mistakes, but come for help, right? Or ask questions. Absolutely. And I think so often, you know, one of the reasons I'm so want to have so many more female leaders in the world, we both take and make different decisions because we, we see different parts of society sometimes than men see. But I think so often girls look up and they see a female leader. You know, they might like at you look at you, Aviva, and think, you know, your English students think, oh my gosh, she's always been good at teaching or she's always been good at presenting or writing a manuscript. No, you've had to learn that. I know young women look at me and say, oh, she's always known how to do this. No, are you kidding? And I think I even talk about in the book, the first speech I did, I was so nervous Bill and I were doing a speech together, but he was going first and I was going second. And I tell the story in the book, I made him leave the hall where we were because I was so nervous because I didn't want to speak in front of him. And so he got in the car and he drove around the building several times and came back and picked me up when I was done with my part. Now, when I speak with him, I'm like, move over, honey. I've got something I want to say. <laughs> but it's an evolution to become a leader, right? Right. Well, and you talk about how you were reluctant at first to... to to become the sort of public face of the foundation too, right? And I think um, perhaps, I mean, you tell me, but perhaps those things are inter interrelated, right? The sort of perfectionism that you talk about, the concern with sort of being out there and being the one who is, is sort of put on the spot, right? Well, and I think this is why it is so important for women to speak up or anyone to speak up. Because I, again, I think I tell the story in the book, but I would so often, I mean, it's also what society does to us. So, so often I would go as a co-chair of the foundation early on and Bill and I would walk into, you know, a leader's office, a president, a prime minister, whomever, and the, they would throw out a question and the first person they would look, turn to, to mm. answer it was Bill because they assumed he had all the knowledge. So it was like this sort of bias they had. And yes, he's known as smart. He's known as starting Microsoft, but guess what? I know just as much about the foundation's work. And so I had to learn to speak up early and often. Mm -hmm. And then people started to realize, oh, wow, she knows a lot about these topics and has similar points of view to her husband, but even different ones. But without my voice, we wouldn't have gone as far as we are going now on these gender issues as a foundation. And quite frankly, we wouldn't have been as effective. No, I mean, I, th I think this is a, a really important lesson to impart, right? The, the need to be able to speak out um, and speak up. And I want to sort of take that on its, on its flip side for a moment to go back to something you said towards the beginning. Um, you talk in the book about um, the many mentors and teachers that you've had in your career. Um, and also, as you, started, as you started to talk about earlier, the many people, women and girls um, and other people you've talked to um, and you also talk about how listening, and this is what you were saying earlier, how listening is central to your philosophy. So we're talking about speaking out and speaking up, but I also want to come back to this idea of listening um, because I was really struck by, um, you talk about him a couple of times in your book. Um, one of your mentors, Hans Rosling, who's a, for, for others, a Swedish global health expert um, who thought the first time he met you that American billionaires giving away money will mess everything up, right? <laughs> I, I loved this sort of moment in the book um, because you talk about how Rosling urged you to listen to people on the margins. Um, and so maybe we could just speak for a few moments about how storytelling is central to your work um, and how the stories you've heard and retell um, 
sort of shaped the book, right? Which is what you were talking about. So how can storytelling and listening be acts of social justice? Because I think that's in some ways one of the things you're getting at. I think if we don't hear one another, we don't really know what's needed or how we might help or create change in in our home, in our society, in our communities. And what Hans taught me, Hans Rosling was, um, yes, an epidemiologist and a global health expert out of Sweden. He's passed away in the last few years. But what he continued to be one of my teachers, but because he had, he and his wife had worked in several countries in Africa and he'd been a doctor on the ground, he had learned the importance of listening to people. And he would tell me stories of what he'd learned as an early doctor that helped inform me of how I should listen more when I would be out in these communities. And, you know, somebody else I really like is Brene Brown. And she talks about how statistics are really, you know, human beings with their lives and their stories. And we can't just in global health or in any issue in the world look at just the statistics. The statistics often point to where to go or where the problems are. But without understanding the nuances in people's stories, you'll make mistakes and you won't act in the right way. And so I believe this power of storytelling and listening, it helps us see things in a different way. It helps us open our hearts. It's people's stories we first connect with. And then we have to look at the global statistics and see if they're there to know where to act. The other thing I've learned, though, is, as I said, I would be out listening. I would go on these um, trips in the developing world, and I would hear these women's stories. But like, take the case of contraceptives, where they're asking me over and over for contraceptives. I'd come back and read the global statistics, and the global statistics back then said contraceptives are stocked in. So you wouldn't think we had a problem. Right. Well, when you looked deeper in the statistics, it turned out condoms were stocked in because of the AIDS epidemic. But women will tell you all over the developing world, I can't negotiate a condom even in my marriage because if, if there's AIDS in the community, I'm either suggesting my husband's been unfaithful or I've been unfaithful. Mm -hmm. And so we weren't actually collecting the statistics about the contraceptives that women were using and wanted. And this is, I bring this up because this is true about so many women's issues all over the mm -hmm. world. We haven't collected the statistics because the statisticians or who's moving the money to the statisticians to collect the data in the past hundred years, it was men. And so they would go in and sometimes even the questionnaires would be unintentionally biased. And so without those statistics, we don't actually know all the ways to intervene on behalf of women's lives. And the same is true for minorities. And those are statistics we need to gather and stories we need to gather if we're going to know how to act. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that you're conveying is, is it's important to have these sort of layers of information, right? So to have both the kind of general global, I mean global actually, not in the geographic sense, but in the um, in the sense of having sort of widespread information through statistics, right? And then to have the specific information through anecdote, through stories, through talking to people and understanding where those needs are. Um, absolutely. Mm, for sure. So actually, I think that that, um, that maybe is a, a good segue because I wanted to talk about a couple things that are not necessarily explored in the book, but I think sort of have happened since, for example, <laughs> um, since writing the moment, the moment of Lift, we've experienced an, and actually are still continuing to experience a worldwide pandemic. Um, so I'd be interested, and I'm sure all of us would be really interested to hear how um, COVID-19 has impacted the foundation's ability to engage in its, its research and its philanthropic work. Um, are there new challenges emerging because of the pandemic that you're, you're thinking we will need to be combating in the coming years? Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, COVID-19 has stopped a lot of progress dead in its tracks. So where the world had been in decline on poverty year over year over year, it's now on the rise. And it's particularly on the rise for women. And it's women all over the world. Um, you know, even if you take women in the United States, you know, 275,000 jobs 
were women's jobs that were lost last year in the United States versus 71,000 male jobs. You know, two thirds of the jobs lost in South Africa were held by women. So poverty is on the rise. Um, you know, vaccinations were halted for a while in many of the countries that we work in. Those are back working now. Um, but yes, many, much of our work, you know, was stopped in its tracks and set back. And we'll, that's work we will have to continue and further on. Um, the foundation, while we continued our work and we made some pivots, we also, though, worked very hard on these COVID vaccine nineteen COVID nineteen vaccines because mm-hmm. we are part of that global ecosystem with the pharmaceutical companies, with scientists, with the disease modelers. So Bill and I um, committed an additional one point seven billion dollars this year for COVID nineteen specifically mm-hmm. because we want to make sure that tests and drugs and vaccines and more oxygen and supplies get out to low-income countries because they're suffering just like we're suffering here in the United States. They're losing loved ones. And yet so often the world, you know, kind of takes care of the high-income countries and the middle-income, but we leave behind these low-income countries. And that shouldn't be. Um, Morally, it's wrong. But economically, we're not going to get a global recovery if this you know, virus keeps bouncing back and forth between our borders. So um, that's an additional piece we've done. And then as we look forward, absolutely, the world has to prepare for another pandemic because it's not a matter of if, it's when. And yet, if we have a pandemic preparedness system, a surveillance system, um, a group of people who can go immediately respond, if we're working on vaccines already and have a stockpile, you know, with some of these variants of things that are coming, we actually can attack the, the a virus like this much more locally very and keep it contained versus letting it emerge and break out around the world. But, you know, we have a short memory as a world. And so we're quite involved already in thinking about pandemic preparedness with a number of governments. Well, I'm sure I'm not alone. You know, we just passed the one year anniversary of quarantine beginning, right, for everyone. And um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in, in thinking back to how we all thought it would just be maybe a couple weeks or a month or two. Totally. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that this sort of looking forward and recognizing that we need to be better prepared next time um, and, and finding ways to do that. And I, th- I think what you're saying also emph- emph- emphasizes the connectedness that you're talking about, right, as well that you were talking about. Right. I think so, so often we want to not think of ourselves as a global community, mm-hmm. but we are. I mean, people get up on an airplane and they fly from, you know, Lagos, Nigeria to New York and New York to Beijing and Beijing to, you know, some uh, Sydney, Australia. I mean, we are connected mm-hmm. and we, we need to not only admit that, we need to do something about it. And it's, you know, it's no surprise that the countries that had dealt with SARS before were prepared and did much, much better during this mm-hmm. pandemic than the others like the United States. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, and and your sort of notion of empathy also would be really, um, I think, would make a big impact, right, in how we handle, handle these kinds of things in the future as well, right? Definitely. Um, So before we're in just a moment, we're gonna move to um, having student questions, but I have one more question um, that I think will sort of segue into that, um, into into their questions, which is that both um, K through 12 education and post-secondary education are currently major platforms for the foundation. So um, what advice, well, two questions, I guess. So what kind of specific initiatives are you working on and, and why? But also, what advice do you have for those of us at post-secondary institutions like ASU, faculty, administration, staff, students, um, on a way to make sure that institutions can withstand adversity, achieve justice, um, and sort of help our students and ourselves concentrate on improving um, equity and inclusion? Mm. Well, I think, you know, this year has just been hard. (laughs) It's been hard on students it's been hard on teachers. It's been hard on families who've lost uh, loved ones. So, you know, we're we're going through an unprecedented time. And I have to say, the resilience I've seen between, you know, 
students this year has just kind of blown my mind. Um, you know, many working from home, from their computers, from in their bedrooms, you know, they'd like to be on a college campus, but they can't, or maybe they're in an apartment off campus. And my heart really goes out to the many students who don't even have access, right, to Wi-Fi or, um, you know, good broadband connection or a computer. There are, I would say, some opportunities that this time has presented to us. You know, ASU has been on the forefront, and I'm not saying this in a gratuitous way at all, on the forefront of this digital learning and Mm -hmm. on how do you bring people, no matter what their zip code, to a campus and help them get all the way through college with the supports they need because they can get a degree. And a degree makes an enormous difference in terms of getting a great job in in our economy. So um, digital, though, is here in a way that would have taken us as a nation probably another decade to get there in U.S. education. And now we need to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, We're shifting uh, some of our strategies in K through 12 to take advantage of that time. There are great ways to do, for instance, advising of students, students who maybe live in a home where no one tells them they could go to college, no one explains to them how to fill out the FAFSA form, no one says to them there's scholarships available. If you start with a student freshman year and you give them great advising, they can absolutely make that entire pathway on to college um, and get a good credential. So there's opportunities there. There's opportunities for much better online curriculum than we have today. We're seeing some bright, shining lights in curriculum, but those need to be spread. There need to be more of them. We can use digital to really assess where students are so teachers can intervene. So those are some of the things that the foundation is already involved with and looking at. But we're really, really interested in how do you make sure every low-income student has the opportunity to make it all the way through the K through 12 system and on through college, because that's how they're going to get a great credential to then get a great job in the economy. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of loss points there. And we look at those loss points and how to intervene. Um, Lastly, I would say your, your question about ASU, um, you know, I think you're already doing a lot to make (laughs) sure that, uh, you know, that students can come there and no matter what their preparation is, maybe they had terrible, algebra two in high school. I mean, that's one of the big loss points, right? Is students who come in and they need to remediate algebra to go on with their nursing studies or go on to be an architect, you know, helping students understand that, okay, if they've missed some learning because they didn't have a great teacher or they didn't understand the concept, they can absolutely catch that up and still make their way through calculus and be an engineer. That's really important. And I think you all have found ways to do that. And no matter whether the student um, had no one at home supporting them, no matter whether they're white or black or Latina, they can make it in any career they want to. And um, I think that's the society that we're trying to build. And as you all talked about civic engagement too, getting kids to think about students' civic engagement and our democracy and what they all want from our democracy and what they should expect. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is the perfect segue, right, to hear from the students themselves. Um, I want to thank you um, so much for this part of our conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing um, hearing as we continue. I think that the, the first um, student who's going to ask a question is Jessica. So when you're ready, Jessica, if you can turn on your video. There she is. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, my name is Jessica Rodriguez and I'm a third year student majoring in psychology with a minor in speech and hearing science. Several stories in the moment of lift forced me to pause while reading so that I could allow their intensity to truly sink in. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, Mrs. Melinda Gates is, while you were writing, was it difficult to relive some of these influential moments in your life? Was there a chapter that was more difficult to write than the others? Mm, Thanks for that question, Jessica. Yes, there were definitely some of the stories because some of the women that I speak about there, you know, when I would be talking with them, they were in very difficult circumstances. So one of the women I talk about, Marianne, who said she wanted to bring every good thing to this child before she had another, you know, when I followed her back to where she lived, it was very sad circumstances. And the way she was keeping her um, income up was to do laundry for other people. 
And uh, that wasn't easy for her because not every day could she get access to clean water to do that or did she have customers? So when you take those stories in and you hold them, they are hard. Um, but I think they're important to go back to because you they remind you of the circumstances of people's lives. Um, so yeah, so thanks for the question. Great, thanks, Jessica. Um, Reagan, I believe you are. Hi there. Um, hello, Mrs. Gates. My name is Reagan Deisty, and I am a double major in political science and justice studies. Um, I loved reading your book. It's filled with multiple inspiring moments and a lot of captivating ideas. Um, throughout these experiences, has there been a moment or conversation that stood out to you on an individual level that continues to shape the way that you view, pardon me, that you view women, feminism, or the world? Gosh, um, so many, Reagan. It's more like I've had all these moments that sort of add up to one. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you one that might surprise you a little bit. We had former President Carter at the foundation early on when we were just early starting. Very, we were a very small organization. And I said to him, President Carter, is, some, is there something we should know now that it took you a while to learn that we should know now so we don't make that mistake? And he said, oh, definitely. He said, you should know that anything you're trying to do, let's say in a community, to use an example in Africa, he said, um, you need to know that people have to see it as their work. If they don't, if the community doesn't buy in and own it and see it as theirs and want it, you can do all this great work, but as soon as you leave, they're going to go back to doing what they want. And so this came to light for me to your question about feminism. I was uh, in a village in Mali and there was an organization that was in and was trying to teach the women that um, putting a new emollient on their baby's umbilical cord would keep the children more safe than putting this shea butter on the children's um, umbilical cord and that the kids would get less germs and it would be more safe. Well, as soon as the organization left and then they came back three days later, what had the community done? They'd returned to doing the shea butter. Whereas when the, when the nonprofit was there, they were doing what the nonprofit had asked them. And when they asked the women why, like we've, we've taught you this, you were using it, but now you go back, the women said, it's because this is what we've done for generations and you're not respecting what we've done and why we've done it. And when the organization finally realized a way to teach the women how to make an equivalent emollient out of shea butter, but with some other things to, to then make it safe for the babies... Then the women finally took it up, but the organization hadn't listened to the women. There's a lot of wisdom there and we need to listen because families and women and people do things for good reason. And so we have to meet them where they are as we bring in new tools and educate them. And so it was just this very powerful connection to from what President Carter had said to then what I'm literally hearing from these women in this place in Mali. I was like, okay. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks for your question, Reagan. Sorry, speaking of tech difficulties, I suddenly lost my mute button, my unmute button. <laughs> um, sorry. So the next um, student who is going to ask a question is Brian. Gotcha, share Brian Forgum. Hello, Mrs. Gates. My name is Brian Forgum, and I am a history major. Uh, how can I contribute to your foundation's goals to lift women and girls everywhere? Oh, thanks for the question, Brian. Um, well, I mentioned several organizations at the back of the book that you can support. So whether that's giving them $10, $25, $100, you know, Save the Children is one of them. There are several others in the back who really do a lot of work to lift up women and girls. And so whether that's in the health space or whether that's in education, um, there are a lot of places doing incredible work. Um, another thing you can do in the United States is if you care about an issue like all the work that women do for caregiving, if you believe we should have a paid family medical leave policy, write the senators in your state and tell them you believe in it. We are the only, the only industrialized nation that doesn't have paid family medical leave. And it's what's driving so many women out of the workforce right now. They're trying to care for their children. They're trying to care for the elderly. And so they're leaving the workforce and without paid family medical leave, many of them are unlikely to go back. 
So you can both support with your dollars or you can support with your time and your energy by writing a congressperson an email. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. It's great to have those sort of small steps everyone can take, right? Um, Jenna, I think you're next. Hi, Mrs. Gates. Uh, my name is Jenna Barba. I'm a double major in human resources and data analytics. I'm a freshman, so right now I don't really have a clear idea as to what I want to do with those majors after college. I feel like those are very big fields. They're big umbrellas that have a lot of different positions underneath them. Do you have any advice on what positions will center me and allow me to lift women up instead of keeping me and these other women on the margins? Well, data and analytics and HR, you cross those two things in <laughs> any company, you're going to find that there are very few companies that don't have a problem in terms of how many women they have at all levels of management. And the same is true for minorities. So using the data and analytics and then as in the HR role to make sure that the company puts it in their executives' goals. Once you drive for transparency that everybody sees what the data is, and then you tie executives' goals to expectations at the end of review time for having a more inclusive and diverse environment, that's how you make progress. So your job is... Uh, is incredibly important during this time. So I think you're going to find your your way through that. You're going to find lots of opportunities with when you're crossing those two majors. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Alexis. Hello. Um, can you hear me well? Mm-hmm. Okay, awesome. I'm so sorry. Um, hello, Mrs. Gates. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. And um, I loved re reading your book, especially, and was really exciting as well and motivating and um, also some disheartening parts, you know. Um, my name is Alexi Rodriguez. I am currently a third year um, undergraduate um, studying social justice and human rights. Um, and so my question um, to you um, is the following. Um, in terms of elevating the movement of empowering women within my Latino community, you know, what advice would you offer to help overcome oppressive Latino cultural norms, you know, such as machismo or toxic masculinity, um, referring to generalized sexism or misogyny that in ways can prevent the empowerment of Latina women? Mm, I, got, I got love that question. Um, you know, it's going to take other men to really help. So women can call these issues out. They can band together and call them out. But it takes other men. When you hear a man say something that is disparaging of another of a Latina woman, or you hear the bias in his speaking, or you hear him speak over a woman or re-say her point, literally calling him out so he changes. And you have to figure out how to do that. Do you do that in a public forum? Or do you do that in private? But it takes young men like yourself role modeling what we want in society for our Latina women, but then calling out others when they aren't doing the right thing. And sometimes if you have uh, somebody who's in a very powerful position, it takes a group of men and women banning together and going to that person and saying, no, the way you're thinking about that isn't right. Or the way you're talking about women or treating them just isn't right. And I've seen communities do this and work on this. And when things, again, are out in the open and the community all commits together, hey, we want to take down bias or we want to take down the harassment of women in our community. The community has to commit to it together, but then people have to take concrete actions against those who are committing these infractions. And once you do that, you take on some of the people who have the bigger infractions, you'll be surprised that it cleans up in the rest of the community. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Yes, Thank I will you. definitely stand up and, you know, take charge. Thank you so Thanks. much. Hey, um, Bailey. Hi, Mrs. Gates. Um, first of all, thank you so much for um, coming and speaking to us. I know your book and um, your talk so far have been so inspiring to me, um, and I'm sure everyone else in the audience, so thank you. Um, my name is Bailey Shaw. I'm a second year elementary education major, so there's a special place in my heart for all of the work uh, your foundation does um, for education as well as for women. Um, so in your book, you speak a lot about your experiences traveling to different countries and speaking to these communities um, and to the women that your work would be impacting. Um, 
And you say that this, this shifted your focus from child death to um, more of family planning and women's empowerment. Um, so I'm curious, do you think um, you would have known to make the shift in your work had you not done that on the ground kind of uh, research and investigation around the initial challenge? And what might have been the impact of your work had you not come to this realization? And then more importantly, how do you think we can make sort of social change from afar um, or can we at all? Yeah, so I, at least for me personally, I don't think I ever would have come to this full realization if I hadn't traveled and been out in these places. And if I hadn't listened, if I'd only gone in and espoused my point of view, I would still be working on the things I was working on before. And that would have been convenient, right? I mean, we're still trying to tackle childhood death and vaccinations as a foundation, but it's in the listening that you learn and you see where further changes are needed. And even if I had sat back and, as I said, read the statistics, the statistics don't paint the picture of women's lives. They just don't. In fact, one of the longest running household surveys that had been administered for over 30 years in the developing world, they would go in and ask a family, let's say it's a man and a woman, a couple, they'd say, well, who's the main breadwinner? And as soon as, it was often the man who answered. And as soon as he answered, they went down a whole series of survey questions about his income, but they never asked her if she had income. And quite often women do, but they get it from the informal sector. And we didn't ask women how they spent the money differently than men. And they actually spent it very differently. So I know for me, I would not have seen that had I not been out there and listened. When I think of um, how we further issues in the United States, I think so often it means that we do have to listen to other communities. Um, listen to people of color, listen to people who didn't grow up in the same zip code as us, listen to children. I mean, you're going to go in the education system and you're going to learn a lot from the kids about what's actually going on in their home. Um, And some of that is often very, very hard to hear, but when you hear it repeatedly as a pattern from different kids or different kids who are coming from a particular community maybe versus another one, you'll start to hear what's going on in that community and it'll cause you, I think, to then decide you want to act. Because we know, for instance, when kids show up at the educational system, they're not all showing up from the same place. A child whose parent is homeless and shows up in kindergarten is very different than a child who shows up from a high income zip code, right? Or a child who's heard gunshots during the night and is scared when they show up at school and versus another child who maybe hasn't had breakfast versus another one who has had breakfast. Those are very different circumstances. And so I think this listening that we need to do, um, and that you'll certainly do, I hope, in the education system, um, helps inform kind of where we need to go if we're going to change society from a social justice standpoint. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think we just have um, one more question from Phoenix. Hi, my name is Phoenix and I'm an applied math major um, and I also really enjoyed your book. Um, I was wondering about how you decide where to travel, how long to stay, and ultimately like what battle to fight among all of the ones gender inequality like has created. There are so many issues within gender inequality and they continuously exist all around the world. Um, how do you know where to go next and who to help next? That is a great question, Phoenix, and one that I wrestle with and our foundation wrestles with all the time because exactly as you said, there are so many issues. There's a plethora of issues out there. And so I have really tried to say kind of what are the couple of biggest barriers that hold women back? And again, if you look at the two biggest barriers for women, they're abuse and harassment. Um, whether it's abuse at home or harassment in the workforce. Just to give you an example, women leave their job at twice the rate if they've been harassed in their job. They're more likely to leave within two years than a woman who's not harassed. So abuse and harassment, and then this caregiving, this unpaid work that women do in their homes to care for the young, to care for the elderly, to get the lunch boxes together, to get the laundry done, a meal on the table, all that unpaid labor. So I look at those two issues. And then I look at what are the issues that move women along in terms of empowerment. Family planning is one of them. Education is one of them. 
Um, in a high income country like ours, it's certain sometimes other things. It's like saying, okay, when women get to a certain point, what industries are they not far along enough in and how would we change those? So I try to take a very systematic approach, but I will tell you it's not easy. <laughs> and then how I decide where to travel has a lot to do with the foundation. They make recommendations to me on places I should go for new sets of learning and to check up on some of the work we do or others do. And so we'll put a trip together with that in mind. And if I'm traveling to the continent of Africa, I'll try and go to several places while I'm on the continent. And then I also, I think, write about my book. I try to take time for quiet before I come home because you take in so much that breaks your heart, but you've got to take it in before you come back home to our busy lives. And so I can walk back into the foundation and say where I think we still need to build on our work. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Thanks for the question, Phoenix. Well, we're, we're coming close to the end of our time. Um, so there was, there was one other student who um, wasn't able to end up staying for the Q&A, but I'm going to ask her question because I think it's actually one that um, a lot of people might be interested in hearing your answer. So her, her name is Adriana. And she wanted to know if you could give your 21-year-old your self one piece of advice, what would that advice be? Mm, at 21. Or college age. Yeah, yeah. You know more than you think you do. <laughs> and, you know, I, in college, I knew a lot about who I wanted to be in the world. And I don't know, there are parts in life that sort of, at least for me, pulled me away from my truest self at times. And yet it was always in there. And when you circle back to it, I think you're already pretty baked, even by the, you have a lot to learn in life and you have a big journey and a lot of wisdom ahead, but you're pretty fully baked, I think, I hope, in terms of your values when you get to college. Mm -hmm. And yes, you may go to one too many, you know, beer parties or something in college or 10 too many. But if you remember who you are and where who you want to be in the world and you don't forget that, you're going to be a pretty great adult. And the last thing I would say is um, just keep learning. Learning does not end at the end of college. And even if you got a degree in applied math or in civics or in English, you can go and learn biology or engineering or computer science if you want. Learning never ends. And you can learn from a lot of different people. And um, having some curiosity just makes it all a lot more fun. Yeah. And then it all goes back to listening, right? Yeah. Listening and learning. Yeah, for sure. Well, Melinda, thank you so much for doing this with us today. It's been inspiring and enlightening. And um, I'm looking forward to sort of processing all of this as, as we move forward. Um, I also want to thank uh, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the School of Civic, Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, Department of English, of course, Macmillan Publishers, and then of course, um, President Crow, uh, Dean Jeffrey Cohen, and Professor Kyle Jensen, who also helped to organize this event. But again, my you know most sincere thanks to you, Melinda, and this has been such a pleasure. Oh well, thank you. Thanks for hosting me, and it was lots of fun. And thanks for the conversation, Aviva. And I really appreciated the student questions as well. So good. Yes. Have and a good just, evening. Sorry. And to everyone in the audience, um, as we as we log off, please, we have one more of these tomorrow talks coming. So please join us for our last installment in the spring, um, April 15th, when our own Regents Professor uh, and Director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, Ayana Thompson, will discuss her new book, Blackface. So, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. <laughs>